Hi, I'm Associate Professor Jessica Gildersleeve. I work at the University of Southern Queensland in Australia and I'm the author of the introduction to Handheld's new edition of Rose Macaulay's Non-Combatants and Others. I'm very pleased to be virtually with you at this launch today. And I just wanted to share with you a few thoughts I had in approaching writing this introduction, um, particularly the way that Macaulay deals with issues of pacifism, um, feminism, women's role in relation to war um, or not wanting anything to do with war uh, during the First World War and the years following. And I think that when we think about pacifism in Britain during and after the First World War, um, we typically first recall, I think, well, I do anyway, uh, Siegfried Sassoon's famous protest of 1917, the open letter finished with the war, a soldier's declaration, in which he asserts, I am a soldier convinced that I'm acting on behalf of soldiers. I make this protest to destroy the callous complacency with which the majority of those at home regard the continuance of agonies which they do not share and which they have not Im enough imagination to realise. However, that statement and the celebrated protest poetry of the period exemplifies the widespread privileging of the combatant voices of wartime, rather than including the perspectives of the non-combatants, who typically include, of course, women. This militarist discourse actively worked to oppress women and suppress their voices. And as one critic observed in 1914, the military state is the state in which woman has no place. The military mind is the mind that sees in woman only a drudge or a toy and gives her the one right only to existence, the possibility of bearing sons who will in time become soldiers. Macaulay's novel, Non-Combatants and Others, is one of only a few which depict instead the perspective of war from women at home, and in particular those who do have enough sympathy and imagination to want to abolish war altogether. In one sense, then, Macaulay's wartime writing emphasises the way women's work at home was just as critical, if just as dull, as men's work on the front, as in her poem Spreading Manure, beautiful title, uh, from 1916, where she writes, I think no soldier is, as, is so cold as we, sitting in the Flanders mud. I wish I was out there, for it might be a shell would burst to heat my blood. I wish I was out there and off the open land, a deep trench I could just endure. But, things being other, I needs must stand frozen and spread wet manure. But Macaulay also pays attention to the experiences of non-combatants more broadly, constructing a community of anti-war activists and sympathisers that moves beyond only women's experience. That Alex in Non-Combatants and Others is a largely androgynous figure, a non-combatant who limps as if she is herself a returned soldier, breaks down those boundaries to drive the point home. The works collected in this volume, uh, Non-Combatants and Others and Other Writing Against War from 1916 to 1945, signifies an evolving history of pacifism and attitudes to the First World War in Britain from the early years of the Great War until the closing years of the Second. Indeed, Macaulay was never comfortable with the more formal political collectives against war. Um, in the 1930s, she did become a member of the Peace Pledge Union, along with other prominent women writers like Vera Britton and Storm Jameson. Um, but over time, she came to feel that the Peace, Peace Pledge Union, um, their neutra neutrality was veering too close to sympathy for the Nazis and a lack of sympathy for their victims. In May 1939, for example, she wrote that in its publication, The Peace News, the Peace Pledge Union appeared to give an impression of partiality on this Nazi business, of condoning or minimising cruelty, and that occasionally when reading some letters in Peace News, I and others half think we've got hold of the black shirt by mistake. What prominently emerges in Macaulay's writing against war is this idea of acting against violence and cruelty, as well as the importance of community and connection in doing so. It's by failing to care about others that we approach the domain of violence and the sphere of war. And this behaviour is what makes us civilised, Macaulay believes, and this is what must be fought for at all costs. 
The agony of that requirement and the difficulty of standing up for such morals in the environment of war is what frames Alex, Alex's experiences in non-combatants and others. So I'd like to finish now by reading a short section of the novel from the end of the second chapter when Alex discovers her cousin John, who's a soldier home on leave, sleepwalking in the middle of the night. He's not just sleepwalking, I should say, but he's crying, sobbing, moaning like a little child, like a man on the rack, Macaulay writes. John's sister Dorothy, a nurse, swiftly helps him before returning to Alex, who's vomited from the horror of what she's witnessed. Dorothy turned her head on the pillow towards Alex's corner and said kindly, you'll never be any use if you don't forget yourself, Alex. You couldn't possibly nurse if you were always giving in to your own nerves. After all, what they can bear to go through, we ought to be able to bear to hear about. But of course, you're not used to it, I know. You should come to the hospital sometimes. Good night. If you feel rotten in the morning, don't get up. Dorothy went to sleep. Alex lay and watched the shadows shifting slowly round on the balcony and listened for sobbing, but heard only the quiet murmur of the pines. What they can bear to go through. But they can't, they can't, they can't. We can bear to hear about, but we can't, we can't, we can't. It was like the intolerable ticking of a clock and beat itself away at last into a sick dream. It's that sick dream that Macaulay seeks to recognise in these writings and that she seeks to end, to awaken us from the mindlessness of our own sleepwalking, to awaken us, um, to stop us from sleepwalking into the continued agonies and savageries of war. Thank you uh, and I hope that you enjoy these new Macaulay editions.